you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Jonah. That's where we are in our series at this time. We're going to be in Jonah chapter 2. Uh, again, if you weren't with us last week, you might have not looked at Jonah in a while, so just go to the middle of your Bible and turn right a little bit, and you will find the book of Jonah. I always encourage you to have your own copy of Scripture so that you can follow along for yourself and make sure I'm not making things up. But uh, we're going to be in Jonah chapter 2, and technically we're going to read the very last verse of Jonah chapter 1 and verse 17. But um, I just wanted us to begin today before we do anything else. I was just reminded this week of just the importance and the priority priority of the Word, so that if you hear nothing else, I just want us to begin with that priority of just what God simply has to say through His Word. And so, look at Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 17, and then we'll jump into verse 2. It says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish, and he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and He answered me, I cried for help from the depth of Sheol, and you heard my voice. For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me, all your breakers and billows, they passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight, nevertheless, that's a a sweet word, underline it if you want to, nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you, that's another good thing to underline, but you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto dry land. So, if you weren't with us, just as a, by way of reminder, last week, again, we were in Jonah chapter 1, and what we found is that we, all of us, myself included, just as men and women, we have this tendency to run from God, especially when we don't really like to hear what God has to say. We tend to turn ourselves into our own ideas and our own desires, and we just tend to have this tendency to to run from God. But if you'll recall last week, even though uh, Jonah was told by God at the very beginning of Jonah 1 to arise, go, and proclaim, what Jonah did instead was he arose and he fled to a ship to go to Tarshish, and uh, he slept. He did the exact opposite of what God was asking him to do. God literally said, go this way to Nineveh and preach to them, basically repentance. And Jonah said, I'm going to go the exact opposite way to what we would know as modern day Spain, to Tarshish. He just flees from him. But what I love about this is though Jonah ran and we run and we have that tendency to run just like Jonah, is that God in his goodness not in anything with Jonah. There's nothing really good going on there, but God, because of who he is and his goodness, doesn't let Jonah go. He goes after him. He pursues him because uh, he he, he loves him, and that's the beauty of what we have. There are going to be moments in our life where I've experienced, and I imagine perhaps you have experienced as well, where you have run from God and the things of God and the people of God and the Word of God, and then God in his goodness he, he, he won't leave you alone. <laughs> he continues to almost to, uh, sometimes we might say, well, why is he being harsh or why is there this storm in my life? And at times, as we mentioned last week, at times, those storms in our life are allowed or even ordained by God to grab your attention because he cares, because he is that loving father, as we saw in Hebrews last week, that he comes after us and he comes after us really with his grace. That, that's the key thing that I'm wanting just to hammer home into our minds and to our hearts today is just the goodness and the grace of God pursuing us. But unfortunately, what I found that has crept its way into the life of the church, into the life of just, I think, regular, everyday church members is this idea of some kind of Christianized karma that if we put enough good out into the world, then we're going to get some good back. If we put a, a little bad out into the world, then we should expect some bad to come back. Or we see someone going, well, they're putting bad out into the world. Eventually, they're going to get theirs. And I suppose eternally wise, that is true. But, but we, we've bought into the lie of what is karma. Uh, I, I can remember when I was in college, um, uh, back in that day and time, we had these little circular things called CDs. Some of you may remember those. And uh, 
And if you, were, if you were really with it and had a lot of money, you would even have like a disc changer in the back of your car. So that way it would just keep changing those discs. And uh, me and my roommates, when we were in college, there were three of us. We had a three disc, <laughs> I know, three disc CD changer. And at all times, no matter what, in that rotation was uh, the Counting Crows and generally almost always was, was uh, the band U2. And if you don't know who they are, I'm, you just don't have a good taste of music and that's okay. But I, I, I I thought about this and I was like, should I mention like Stephen Curtis Chapman or, or some other artists? And I was like, no, it's just not what we listen to. Uh, but what we had was always those albums were, were, were in the rotation. But specifically, we, we love listening to U2 and listening to their lyrics. And some of you might know who U2 is. They're this Irish band from Ireland. And uh, their lead front man is a guy by the name of Bono. You may not really know him, but he always wears sunglasses. And he's, a, he's an interesting, interesting guy. And whenever he uh, sat down for an interview in 2005, uh, he was talking to this interviewer, and they were having this discussion about, about faith and about Jesus and about, about a whole bunch of different things. And I, I found this interesting. Uh, listen to what Bono has to say. He says, he said, at the center of all religion is this idea of karma. You know, you put out uh, what comes back to you, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, or in physics and physical laws, every action is met by an equal or an opposite one. And that's what a lot of people in our world today hold to, because we do see that in the, in the physical world. But I love this. He says, yet along comes this idea called grace, and it just upends all of that. Grace seems to defy reason and logic. Love interrupts, if you like, the consequences of your actions he says, which in my case is very good news indeed because I've done a lot of stupid stuff. And the interviewer says, I'd be interested in hearing that. And he goes, that's between me and God. <laughs> he said, but I would be in big trouble if karma was going to finally be my judge. It doesn't excuse my mistakes, but I'm holding out for grace. I'm holding out that Jesus took my sins onto the cross because I know who I am and I hope I don't have to depend on my own religiosity. And so as we kind of talk about this idea of grace that we're going to see here of what Jonah really is experiencing, just as a reminder, grace really is this idea of unmerited or undeserved favor of God towards you, God's unmerited favor. There's, there's a quote by a man that some of you may recognize named A.W. Tozer, and, and he, he expands on this definition of grace, and he says that grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits on the undeserving. I really enjoyed that definition. Grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines God to bestow benefits on the undeserving. So uh, another man said, grace is not merely unmerited favor. It's favor bestowed on sinners who deserve wrath. And, and this is what we saw last week. What Jonah is deserving of his disobedience, what we all deserve because of our sin and our disobedience, is we are willingly separating ourselves from the goodness and the holiness of God. And, and we're reminded in the, in the book of Romans that all of sin fallen short of the glory of God, and what we deserve is consequence for our sin, and yet God in His goodness, just because of who He is, He continues to show us grace, and this is what Jonah is about to experience. He, he doesn't deserve to be saved, but God is good and gracious enough to choose to save him because He's pursuing him. And, and my hope is that maybe some of you need to hear that word this week because perhaps for whatever reason, you feel like you've gone down a path to where you're just a little bit too far gone. I just want to remind you, look at where Jonah got and God just continues to come after him and to love him and to just shower grace upon him. So if last week was Jonah running from God, this is really that idea of Jonah just running right into God, <laughs> into, in, in, that, in the belly of the fish. I was thinking about, have you ever been walking behind someone or running behind someone, and they all of a sudden suddenly stop? It's that idea of God's just like right on Jonah's tail, and just, he's, he slams right into them with, 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 with a fish, and I, and I love this. Um, and so, in Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, it says just these simple words, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. I mentioned this last week, but in all of Jonah chapter 1, he never once, from what we have recorded, spoke to God. He talked about God. He has an understanding of God. He's obviously been serving God, but he's just running from God. Even whenever the pagan sea captain says, Jonah, there's this crazy storm going on all around us. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe we'll be spared. And Jonah appears to remain silent. Finally, he speaks to God. Finally, he begins to say a few things, and, and this is what I began to find and discover is God's grace is always there. 
God's grace is always pursuing us because He is that good. But it wasn't until Jonah prayed that he unlocked the experience of that grace, the, the, the enjoyment of that grace. And for some of you, it's that idea of God is still just so good to you, and He's allowing you to continue just to simply breathe. But until we choose to humble ourselves and pray, we may not on our end get to experience that goodness and the grace of God until we humble ourselves and until we pray. And so, Jonah prays in verse 1 uh, to his Lord as God, and then in verse 2 through 9, you may have noticed in, in your Bible that the, uh, at least in mine, it, it kind of looks very similar to the book of Psalms, even the way that it's written out. It's because this is Jonah later in his life kind of recounting what his prayer was while he was thrown into the sea and as he goes into the belly of the fish, and it's him basically just sharing a poem. He's sharing a song. Because when you experience the grace of God, I, I've found when something really good happens, I tend to get excited and I want to rejoice in that. And so it was pretty normal or common for someone in this day and time that if I experience the goodness or the grace of God, I'm, I'm going to sing. And some of you are the same way today. Whenever you're going through a, a down mood, you want to play some very melancholy, counting crows kind of music because you want to feel that feeling. For others of us, when we're in that kind of joyful, happy mood, we want to turn something on because we want to experience what we're experiencing internally, and we want to have, somehow have that outwardly or tangibly displayed. And that's what Joan is doing here. He's writing a song of just thanksgiving and just excitement for what God has done in his life. So in, in verse 2, this is really a summary of what Jonah has done. He's not yet in the belly of this fish. Uh, it says, I called out of my distress to the Lord. He answered me. I cried out from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice. He calls, God answers. He cries out, God hears him. He prays. And so for, for just a quick little jaunt, if you will, I, I want us to, to take a look at, at Jesus I told you last week that Jesus references Jonah at least three different times in the gospel accounts, and one of those is in Luke chapter 11. And in Luke chapter 11, before he mentions Jonah, it's interesting to me of how he talks about prayer. And, and I don't know if we have time to go through it all. It may, it may be on the screen, but Luke chapter 11 verses, I think about one through eight, what you have is you have verses one through four is kind of a condensed version of the Lord's prayer. Because his disciples came along to him, and, and they, they, they said, uh, after he'd finished praying, they said, Lord, teach us how to pray, or just teach us to pray. And he, he gives them the Lord's Prayer. And then, Sarah Kate, if you don't mind, just jump down to verse 5. Then in, in verses uh, 5 through 8, he, he not just gives them, here's what you should be praying, here's kind of a structure, he then gives them a parable, kind of a teaching. In verse 5, it says, then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers and says, do not bother me, the door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed, I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything, because he is his friend, Yet, because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. When Jesus is sharing this parable on the idea of prayer, he goes from not just simply saying, here's what to pray, here's the structure, but in verses 5 through 8 and even beyond, he's giving the, here's how to pray. And what we find is when Jesus teaches on prayer in Luke 11, and we don't have time to go to Luke 18, what you find is Jesus is saying, when you pray, pray with urgency and, and pray with persistence. And, and when I see that, I have this idea and this sense of this man in this parable who Jesus is sharing is coming to a friend of, I need food. He's desperate for food, so he remains urgent, steadfast, and persistent in his prayer because he's desperate for this need. And what we're going to see here in the, is, is not just in the life of Jonah, but do you not remember even in the life of Jesus? Jesus models not only what He taught in prayer, but the fact of how He did it. Um, he, he, he teaches about it, but then He practices it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before His uh, crucifixion, 
He's there praying in that garden, and he's crying out to God, his Father. And he is desperate, and he is in an intense situation. He's sweating drops of blood. He's, he's anxious about what he knows is going to await him, and yet he remains persistent and desperate and urgent in his prayer to his heavenly Father. But he comes to a point in that moment of humility before God and gains perspective, though he is desperate, and God simply says to him, essentially, you, you got to continue to go through this. So Jesus says, not my will be done, but yours. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this cup of wrath. And, and part of why I share that with you is because we, we see it exemplified in the life of Jesus, teaching it and practicing prayer. But we see Jonah here so much a reflection of you and me because we do have that tendency to run. And if at some point, even if it's through desperate measures that God is getting your attention through a storm, it's hopefully to cause us to stop and pray. Our prayerlessness testifies what we actually believe about God. Sometimes we think that God is capricious or erratic or fickle. But when we read the rest of Scripture, does it, that doesn't seem to line up. Our, our lack of prayer trim, demonstrates at times what we, what we truly believe about God. Whether something in your life is your fault or not, what we find from Jonah is this good news that you could still offer up a desperate prayer to God. And some of you right now, you're in a season of life or you're going through something and you're wondering, can I really and will he care and will he listen? Some of you think you just can't. Maybe you're too far gone. I just want to remind you, look at the life of Jonah. Desperately cry out to your good father because he is good and he is gracious. Some of you have, have, have made the comment that I've made. Why should I pray? He's sovereign. He already knows. And what I find is that, again, it's until Jonah prays, that's when he experiences, the, experiences personally the goodness and the grace of God, though it's always there. Perhaps some of us are exempting ourselves not from having to change circumstance, because prayer doesn't always change our circumstance, but what prayer will always do when we are in humility to a good and sovereign, gracious God is it will change you. And what I need in my life when I'm going through the storm is though he may not take me out of it, but take me through it, I, I need him so that I can endure that storm. So if you're taking notes, number one is just I want us to look at this prayer of desperation, this prayer of desperation by Jonah. Look at verse 3. When he said, you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the currents engulfed me, what, what we're finding here is that this prayer of desperation is Jonah basically saying, in my mind, I don't really know what to pray or what I should do, but I need you, so I'm praying. And what we find is that at this point, he's not, I, I don't believe he's actually in the belly of the fish. I think he has been thrown overboard and he is descending into the depths because we get these different comments that he's at the root of the mountains. He's gone, and that's in verse six. He's gone into the depths of the sea. He's gone to the bottom of the oceans. He has weeds, a seaweed literally wrapped around his head. That there comes a moment when he is just literally descending into the depths of the sea, that Mediterranean sea, with a storm raging above him. And just the darkness, just, just, just literally swallowing him up from below. And I can't imagine how terrifying that moment would be. Have you ever tried to go swimming in the ocean at night with no full moon? Just don't do it. Because everything in the water that like, tickles your leg, you believe is, is jaws. Like you just know something is after you. It's a terrifying thing. And here's Jonah out in the middle of the sea, in the midst of that raging storm. And he's just descending into the depths. I, I believe that it's okay to be desperate. He's desperate in this moment. He's crying out to his God. And what I love, verse 4, uh, some translations don't have this, but they have a variation of it. But I love the New American Standard where it says in verse 4, I said I have been expelled from your sight. He's acknowledging, yeah, I, I shouldn't even be in your presence. Verse 4, it says, nevertheless... I don't know what your translation says, but I love that phrasing in the New American Standard of nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. It's this incredible prayer of faith. Even when we think that God can't see us, though he can, nevertheless, though I'm not worthy, I cry out anyway. I'm desperate for you. 
Jonah, I believe, is saying, I'm responsible for my predicament. I'm responsible for the problem and the situation that I'm in, but I'm going to look to you again, God. I'm, I'm urging you today, anybody watching, listening, in the sound of my voice right now, that you would have just this desire to say, I'm in this situation, but I want to remind you, cry out to God again. He's there. He's pursuing you. He cares for you. And, and again, it says Jonah is doing this, that he's beginning to now, I think, experience the grace of God. And when we talk about the grace of God, we, we could do a whole seminar for like weeks on studying the grace of God. And so one of the things that we all experience, whether you are a part of the family of faith or not, whether you have placed your faith in Jesus or not, is all of us experience that common grace of God. Because Scripture says, all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. So God in His goodness and His graciousness, He should, out of His justice and His righteousness, say, you've sinned, consequence for your sin, the penalty of sin is death. But He is such a long-suffering, patient, and good God, He still dispenses His common grace of not taking us out so that there could come a moment where we would hear the gospel of Jesus and experience the saving grace of God. So there may be some of you that you are experiencing and have experienced the fact that you breathe, you experience the grace of God. The fact that your heart is beating, you experience the grace of God because what we deserve is not life. We deserve death because of our sin. That's what we've earned. But God's unmerited favor to you, even if you don't believe in Jesus, don't care about Jesus or the things of Jesus, God still cares about you and God is still gracious and good to you. But for those of you who have heard the gospel of Jesus and you've repented and humbled yourself and placed your faith in him, then you get to experience that grace and experience the saving grace of God. Let that just, look, this week that just washed over me and it was just, honestly, moments of just being overwhelmed of why and how, God, you are so, so good to us. And I don't know about you, but for me to experience the grace of God, when I came into saving faith in Jesus, it wasn't the words, it wasn't some magic uh, phrase that I said, but what I did is there was humility, contrition, brokenness, and I did speak and I prayed to God. And when I prayed then, because of His goodness and His grace, I'm experiencing His salvation. There comes a moment where we got to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. We've got to use what He's given us. And so, God's grace is so, so incredibly good. Um, about five or six years after the interview that Bono had with you two, uh, or excuse me, five or six years before that interview, excuse me, in the year 2000, you two had released an album called All That You Can't Leave Behind. And one of their specific titles, one of the tracks, was called Grace. And when they sang and wrote about grace, they, they, they kind of did like in the book of Proverbs where wisdom was referenced as almost like a, a lady. And this is some of the lyrics. It says, grace, she takes the blame. She covers the shame. She removes the stain. She travels outside of karma because grace makes beauty out of ugly things. So the first thing is we need to be like Jonah and cry out, have a prayer of desperation. That's number one. Number two is that he has a prayer of deliverance, a prayer of deliverance. He's met with grace. There in verse six, like in, right in the middle of verse six, it says here, but you, but you have brought up my life from the pit. I believe it's at this moment that literally death is about to encompass him. The seaweed is wrapped around him. He's descending into the depths of that dark abyss. And then this fish comes along and he swallows him up. And it's, it's the means of God's grace. It's the vessel of God's grace to, to save him. And again, if, if you want to hear about this some more, go back to last week's sermon of people will ask the question, a fish, really? Did this actually happen? Again, I would encourage you, go back to last week's sermon and listen to that because we, we, we do take a moment to look at that because in the end, the purpose of the miracle of the fish is to do what all miracles do. They all don't make sense. They are all supernatural because they point us to God. So yes, as I mentioned last week, if I can believe that uh, Jesus died and rose again, I believe in that miracle. Yes, I can believe that a fish came and swallowed up Jonah. Do I understand the physics and the mechanics of how he survives in that nasty, just confined space? No, I don't. But I, I don't understand the, 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 the science and the fish. How did Jesus come back to life? God. That's, that's how. 
And so what we find here is that he, Jonah, has abandoned God's call, should have died. He's thrown into the sea, he should have died. He's swallowed by a big, ugly fish, should have died, but he didn't. It's again that beauty. Jonah sinks down, God reaches down. God's grace is so good, not just to reach down, but to reach him up and out. Jonah's in the sea because of his own doing. He ran, he's reaping what he sowed. But then we come to the, again to that point of nevertheless, or but you, but you who have brought me out, uh, brought my life up out. C- c- can I just ask you that maybe today needs to be your day of nevertheless. Maybe today is your moment where you cry out to God and say, I, I have been so far from you. I've been the prodigal or I am just, I, I just haven't even want to give any attention to you or the things of you or to the gospel or to Jesus. But nevertheless, this is your moment where you would come along and you say, yes, I've ran and, and I've run and I'm actually running right now. I keep running again and again to that relationship to bring me satisfaction. I keep running again to complaining because that seems to kind of fulfill me. I run to coveting. I run to fear again. I run to depression again. I run to porn again. I run to insecurity again. I run to escapism again. I just keep running, but finally you've gotten my attention. Nevertheless, I desperately cry out for your deliverance. I want that to be our prayer today. Nevertheless, Though I run and I am at fault, nevertheless, I desperately cry out for your deliverance and for your grace. In verse 6, when he says, you brought up my life from the pit, he finally says, O Lord, my God. Before, in chapter 1, he just talks about the Lord, the God of heaven. It's a little bit more personalized here because he's experiencing the saving grace of God. He says, you have delivered me. You can pick your means of rebellion, but you can't pick your means of salvation. Salvation is from the Lord. We, we don't get to decide what that looks like. So we can choose to wander and to flee and to go away, but it's God's means of salvation. And what's beautiful about this, but what is difficult, is that God brought Jonah through this in the belly of the fish. It makes me think of Jesus. God didn't deliver Jesus from the cross. He delivered Jesus through the cross. Some of you, you're in the midst of something that just doesn't make sense, and it is uncomfortable, and it is hard, but perhaps God is not delivering you through or from your storm, but He's going to deliver you through the storm. I mean, think about what Jonah is experiencing. Though he is at fault, God is still saving him. His grace is still good, but it doesn't always mean that grace is easy or comfortable. (laughs) Sometimes grace is convicting and hard, but it's still grace. It's still salvation. It's still His goodness. Can you imagine being in the confines of, of a fish for, for, for three days and three nights? Just the smell alone? When I order fish, I ask it not to be fishy. I mean, it's just, it's just nasty stench and smell. And there he is in the intestines. I'm sure it, it's, it's cramped, it's tight. Are any of you claustrophobic? This guy, you, you, you can find me. I don't like it. And it's just one of those things of like just true darkness and just wandering. And literally you are at the grace or at the mercy of wherever that fish is wandering around in the Mediterranean. And hopefully you're a big enough fish. No other fish is going to come swallow you up. I mean, it's just this terrifying experience. And he's left there for three days and three nights. And yet he recognizes though this really is hard, you're saving me. Some of you, you may be going through something that does not comprehend or make sense rationally, and you're wondering, when's the relief going to come? You've had seasons of life, I've had seasons of life, of when, when will there be the relief? I would just say, step back for just a moment and, and recognize Christian God's grace is always there, and so can you see God's grace even in the uncomfortable moments, His goodness in your life? He may not deliver you out, but He will deliver you through. I want to highlight two two specific verses, verses 4b and 7b. That's to get very technical and kind of nerdy, but in verse 4 and verse 7, you may have noticed this, this repetition. It says, "'Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple.'" And then in verse 7, at the end of verse 7, he says, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Basically what he's wanting to do is I want my prayers to go to God. Because what Jonah as as an Israelite, as a Hebrew, recognized that their understanding was 
Israel, the nation of Israel, was like at the center of the world. And in some ways, it really was there in the uh, there in the ancient Near East, that area of the world was that land bridge between Africa and Asia and Europe. I mean, it's this really centralized piece of geography in the known world at that time. And the Israelites believed Israel is at the center of that, and at the center of Israel is Jerusalem, and at the center of Jerusalem is the temple, and at the center of the temple is the Holy of Holies, and at the center of the Holy of Holies is the Ark of the Covenant, and at the Ark of the Covenant we have God's law, but above God's law we have God's mercy, His mercy seat. And He's crying out, saying, I want my prayers to go not just wherever, because sometimes don't we do that? We're just like, if someone's out there, just please help me. And Jonah's saying, no, 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 no. I want my prayer to go directly, though I am unworthy. Nevertheless, I'm going to cry out, even though in my sin and in my rebellion, I'm going to cry out to the one true God, and I want to go straight to you and into your presence, because I know you will hear my prayer, because at that day and time, sacrifices are continuing to go on, therefore we can cry out to you. The day of atonement year after year is continuing to happen of the unblemished spotless lamb being sacrificed to take away the sins and that blood of that lamb being sprinkled as an atonement upon the mercy seat there on the Ark of the Covenant. So he knows because of that, you will hear me. Christian, listen to me. Because of Jesus and his death as a sacrificial lamb, his blood has been sprinkled on the mercy seat. Therefore, God hears you and he knows you. Go to him. Say, nevertheless, though I have wandered so far from you, God, though I have lived my life however I wanted to, and it's been rough, nevertheless, I cry out to you, my Lord, my God. Sorry, I got lost. Um, so I was listening to a, to a guy, some of you know who Tony Evans is, and he had a great, I think, example of this. Tony Evans made this comment. He said, when you pray, you and your prayers are in two different locations. He said, for example, he was stuck in an elevator, and as he was stuck in that elevator, he, he, he found that there was just no one to help. And he said, I could do several things. I could blame others who's the moron who built this thing, and why is it stuck, and why am I stuck in here? This thing should be moving to doing what it's supposed to. Or you could blame yourself and say, if I just gotten ready 30 minutes earlier, I wouldn't be in this situation. So you get mad at yourself because you could have done something differently. Or you can calm down, and you can see that there's a little tiny door that you can open up, and there's a telephone that you can pick up, and you can call someone because what you need is someone outside of your situation to help you within your situation. When we pray, when Jonah is praying, he's, what he's revealing to us, to himself, is that he understands, humbles himself, and says to God, God, you are outside of my situation. I need your saving. When you and I pray and we humble ourselves, Though we may not get what we are asking for, it reveals our need of God who is outside of our situation and is able to save you. You're saying, I need you. He goes on in verse 8, and verse 8 is a really interesting verse, and it's been translated so many different ways. In my translation, the New American Standard, it says, those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. But I found a translation from a guy that I really appreciate named Alistair Begg, and uh, can, is that the one? No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, wh- what he says is, uh, where are you at? Where are you at? Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And, and it, it brought that verse alive because the word where it says faithfulness or the word where it says grace is the Hebrew word that's, that is basically translated as, as hesed. And hesed is essentially this idea of the covenantal love of God, the grace of God, the goodness of God, the mercy of God, so on and so forth. And, and what Jonah is saying here is if I and if we as individuals cling to something that is outside of God, we're forfeiting the grace of God. Like, like we're just, literally, it's that idea of you're shooting yourself in the foot. Like, like, it doesn't make any sense, but yet when we run, if we're not careful, when we run from God, that means oftentimes we're running to something else, to someone else. And when we do so, we're shooting ourselves in the foot, and we're forfeiting the goodness and the grace and the love and the mercy 
of God. So I, I would ask you, are you looking at this time, not a year ago when you were just really rocking it for Jesus, but right now, are you looking for something or someone else to really ultimately satisfy you or to unburden you or to give you relief in this life? Because when you do, you forfeit the grace of God, the covenantal love of God, the chesed of God. You're being ripped away from what should be rightfully yours because you're a child of God. Now, I I love having the opportunity to go to the beach, and some of you know when you go to the beach that every now and then there'll be flags on the beach letting you know how safe the water is. And every once in a while, there might be a double red flag, which is really bad, and generally, I believe the red flags mean there's probably going to be a riptide. For those of you who don't, don't know what a riptide is, is as you go out into the water, next thing you know, the water just wants to pull you out into the ocean. And I've not really had the experience of that. I like it when it's a little bit more turbulent because I'm just like fighting in the water and, and just having fun. But my wife had the opportunity years ago working with a bunch of students when she was uh, in college and she went to this summer beach camp and one of the, the tiny little kids was out there and the riptide just, just, just took him. She went after him. And she realized if I want to get back to shore where safety is, where salvation is, I can't go straight back. I got, I got to go along with the shore and then make my way in. But, but, but what we have is if we're not careful, there are going to be those idols in our life. And I've found that most of the time, not always, but most of the time, for I believe probably many of you, the idol in your life, the thing that really just you struggle with that you keep going back to again and again often is not a bad thing. It's a good thing, but it's a good thing you've turned into a God thing, and it ain't God. He isn't God. She isn't God. So he or she or it will not ultimately satisfy you. It'll just keep ripping you away. Perhaps I've shared this before years past. Some of my greatest idols are the things that I enjoy. I love people, but I can be, I can, if I'm not careful, I will people please. And I have this idol that I have to be careful with. I love my wife, but she's one of my greatest idols if I allow her to become higher on the pedestal than the Lord. That's not good. Some of our idols are the best things in our life. Some of your idols, it might be money. Nothing wrong with money. God uses it for his kingdom and for his work. Some of you might be a relationship with a spouse or with a child. These are gifts from the Lord, but they are not the Lord. We, we have to come back again and again to recognize who is God and who saves me, who satisfies me, who fulfills me. Yesterday, I didn't even have this plan because thank you, Johnny. Johnny graduated yesterday, and I got to experience something that was just really cool, and I was watching these parents bless their children. It was so powerful and so intimate. And in that moment, what you see is you see these these graduates hearing from mom and from dad. And what I loved hearing was as much as they loved them, cherish their child, I heard one particular, I think think it was a father who said, we've raised you, essentially what he's saying, to send you. That ultimately, yes, you are our child, but you're ultimately God's child. You've been a gift given to us from God. you're, You're his. And it's this idea and this mindset that all that we have, all that is good, is from the Lord. And so we want to be careful that we don't make it more than the Lord. And I think Jonah is realizing that. I think that he's coming alive to that. You come into verse 9 during this prayer of deliverance. He says, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Essentially, he's coming to a point of, God, you have saved me, so I'm going to worship you. I'm going to praise you. And what I've promised to do, it will be fulfilled. It's going to continue on because I recognize that what I have is from you. In in, in verse 9, when he says salvation belongs to the Lord, I was thinking of salvation because sometimes when we think of getting saved or being saved, we think of that moment where I prayed and confessed Jesus as Lord. He forgave me of my sin and I was made right with God. I was justified. But we forget that as you kind of continue to go down that line of salvation, there's not just justification, but there's sanctification and then glorification. And what we have is in a moment when we recognize that we're a sinner and in need of a Savior and we repent, God makes us right. He justifies us. He saves us. But when He justifies us, we're being saved from the penalty of sin. We're being saved from that, that consequence of sin. 
But for many of you, I've heard your story, you can tell me that, yes, I can remember humbling myself, calling upon the name of the Lord, and He saved me. He justified me. He saved me from the penalty of sin. But now you're still living 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years later from that moment of salvation. He's in the midst of sanctifying you. You're in that process called sanctification. Your salvation is being worked out. And what's happening now is that sanctification saves you not from the penalty of sin. That already happened. It's saving you from the power of sin in your life. So you might say, I don't think I can resist that idol. Yes, you can. He saved you to be able to overcome the power of that sin by His grace and His goodness and His mercy. It is possible. And the beauty of it is, is that even when it comes to the moment when we breathe our last on this earth, our salvation then leads us into the glorification of our salvation, that we will be with Him forever and forever. The prayer that Jonah uttered is in the face of death, and it was beautiful, it was hopeful, it was confessional. He knows there's no reason I should be alive, but God in His goodness holds back death, and He knows it. Death does not have the last word where God is concerned. Even death obeys God. This is the same point of fact that we see in Jonah's story that we see in Jesus' story. Death does not have the last word where God is concerned. Death has no dominion in God's story of redemption. Jesus defeated death. And so through Jesus, death has no dominion over us who believe in him because from the moment of when you were justified and as you lived out your sanctification, you will defeat death through the glorification of your salvation by the grace of God in your life. So you have, you have no reason to fear and you have the ability to go forward in your faith because of the grace and the salvation of him. Salvation truly does belong to the Lord. He saved you, he keeps saving you, and he's gonna glorify you. That is such, such good news. Do you know him? Finally, in verse 10, it says that the fish vomited up Jonah. He stinks really bad. <laughs> Just imagine that. And think about this. God's means of grace involved being vomited. Again, sometimes the grace of God is not the most comfortable, but it is still so, so good. He's gone through it, but he's alive. He's grateful. He's back on mission. So as a result, what does he do? He writes this poem. He writes this psalm. He writes a song because when you encounter the grace of God and the deliverance of God, you worship, you sing, you give thanks. So, some of you may know who this man is, but there's a man by the name of John Newton. John Newton was born in 1725. His mother was a, a Puritan and taught him some of the basics of the faith of, 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 of Scripture but she died when he was seven years old. So his uh, father was uh, in the Navy. He was a sea captain, and he took his son, John, with him onto the sea. And by the time he was about 11, he was on the sea continuously. And as he was around these very rugged sailors, what he began to do was became very reckless. Uh, he literally cussed like a sailor, and his drinking was something to, to, to behold. Eventually, his father presses him into the British Navy, hoping that this will take out some of the rough edges in his life, give him some discipline. But after a while, he even attempts to desert the Navy. So he gets eight dozen lashes, and he's reduced just to being a common sailor. Finally, he gets hooked up because he needs to make some form of money. He gets hooked up working on a ship called the Pegasus, but it's a slave ship. His co-workers, his fellow sailors, hated John so much that when they got to the west coast of Africa, they deserted and left him there, specifically with a very vile man by the name of Amos, who was an enslaver there in Africa. And Amos gave John Newton as a slave to his wife, where he experienced what it was to be seen as less than human. Finally, John's dad commissioned another sea captain to see if he could go find John. He found him, he saved him, and during the voyage home, the ship that John was on was just caught in this horrendous storm off the coast of Ireland. It was about to sink, and John Newton does what is a good thing to do. He's desperate. He cries out to God to save him. And this is what he says, his own account. He said that he wasn't radically changed all at once. His total reformation was actually more gradual. Quote, I cannot consider myself to have been a believer in the full sense of the word until a considerable time afterward. He later wrote that it was a while later that when he got back to England that he began to go to worship and 
Bible study and read the Bible, and his point of view of these enslaved men and women began to change a little bit. A little bit later on, he actually became an ordained Anglican priest. But it wasn't years later that he actually began to renounce the profession that he was in as a slave trader. At the age, uh, or in 1788, he renounced his former slave profession by publishing a, a, a blazing pamphlet called Thoughts Upon the Slave Trade. And it was so radical and so in your face, the track described the horrific conditions on the ships. And within this pamphlet, Newton apologized, and he made a public statement many, many years after participating in the trade. He says, quote, it will always be a subject of humiliating reflection to me that I was once an active instrument in a business at which my heart now shudders. That tract became so popular, it was reprinted several times. And then, for the remainder of his life, along with a man by the name of William Wilberforce, the English Parliament, and with that leadership and with John Newton also behind it, they began to finally, not having to have the use of a civil war, but through the use of law, they finally passed the Slave Trade Act where it outlawed slavery. John Newton is known primarily now for three main things. One, he was a pastor. He was a minister of the faith. Two, he was an abolitionist. He gave his life toward the end of making sure that slavery would be ceased in England. But number three, as some of you may know, he's probably most well known for writing the hymn Amazing Grace. It's almost the Southern Baptist anthem. It's almost all church anthems. But he penned these words that you guys know, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Some of you, you need to just enjoy the grace of God today. So I want to ask you to do two things. That's it. In just a moment, Michael is going to begin singing. And what I would ask you to do is before you sing and praise God for his grace, that you would follow the example of Jonah and you would pray. That you would pray and cry out a prayer of desperation for your sin and a prayer for deliverance and thanking him for the forgiveness of that sin. Some of you maybe even today, like me, in just a moment, as we've done before at this church, I'm going to grab a pen and a piece of paper, and there's pens and paper back there. You have it there at your seat. And I'm going to jot down some of those idols that seem to just reoccur in my life. And I just want to give them to them again. I don't want to run to something else. I want to run to God. So I want us to have a moment where we pray. And then when we've prayed for deliverance, it is fitting, as with Jonah, that we would sing to the Lord, that we cry out to him. And so I want to invite you guys to stand. And where you're at, whatever it looks like, I want you to desperately, urgently, persistently pray. Some of you feel maybe so distant from God and you haven't prayed in a while. Take the time to do that now, whether you're standing, kneeling, writing. Maybe you want to write a poem. I don't know. Pray out loud where you're at. But I want you to call out and cry out just as Jonah did because he will hear you. And then when you're done, join Michael and say thank you and just sing and worship him this morning. You take the time that you need. If you need me, after I write my thing, <laughs> I'll be right over here. I'll be happy to visit with you and pray with you.